This is the uh, fourth in a series of messages that I've brought on the journey. And this morning is the conclusion of those four, uh, four weeks that we've been talking about. So we're just kind of doing a wrap-up this morning. And I, I want to remind you of a couple of things. I, along the way, I put up this uh, screen one morning, for one you shot for you to look at. And uh, I put a You Are Here era there. Uh, those are kind of important markers for us along the way, I think, sometimes. We used to go to Dollywood when the kids were smaller, kids were at home, and we loved going there, loved going to the mountains, and we'd go to Dollywood, and we'd, they have a lot of different venues that happen there, different, uh, uh, different musicals in different locations, and when you go through the main gate, they give you a kind of a map that you are here. And we would take that map and look at it when we got inside the gate, we were here, and we would look at the different venues that were going to happen, and we kind of plan our day. We would, this, this one's going to happen at 10 o'clock, this one's going to happen at 11.30, and we planned our route so we would get to the venues that we wanted to see. So a map kind of important for us along the way. It tells us where we are. And points out where we need to go. Well, Mark chapter 4 that we've been looking at, the parable that our Lord told the disciples, really does that. It helps us to locate where we are spiritually in our walk with the Lord. And we've been looking at that. I told you uh, there are four groups of people that are in the church. And we are uh, in a church this morning, and there's four groups that are here. You fit into one of those groups this morning. And we're all growing. It's not that you're better than anybody else. It's not that at all. You're, in a, you're on this journey, and we're all seeking to grow in our relationship with God. And I put the word growing in there because if you're not growing, you're regressing. You need to keep growing as you walk with the Lord. So some are in, in just beginning to, to experience the fellowship of the church, and they're exploring God. They've not yet crossed the line of faith, but there are some of you that are beginning in God. Some of you are close to God, and some of you have become God-centered in your life. I put up some words to help us along the way as well. We're, we're enjoying fellowship. We're enjoying relationship. We're being discipled as we grow, as we come to church and we learn, and some are walking in lordship. And I put three words up there. These were kind of the movements from one, well, one section to another. When people are exploring God, they come to the cross and, and they experience grace. And they discover that God's amazing grace can put his arms around them wherever they are and can bring them into a relationship with him. And that's marvelous. That's wonderful. And then you discover the Bible is a wonderful book. I was talking to some of the, the, the ladies who are teachers here this morning. And we were talking about the Bible, and we, we got to talking about, I, I said, you know, when I was in Bible college, we had to memorize passages of Scripture. And I was questioned even about the, the, the diacritical markings, uh, or the punctuation. If that wasn't in the sentence at the right place, you had it wrong. I mean, they were strict. We had to learn the Word of God and learn where to pause and learn where to be excited as we read the Scripture. And that's what the Bible's about. It's a marvelous book. And if you get into the Word, it begins to just bring new life and vitality. And so some of you are beginning to experience that. You're finding about, about the symbols in the Scriptures and how they relate and how the Old Testament's tied to the New Testament, how the New Testament really explains the Old Testament. So we, we've got a marvelous book written over 1,600 years by over 40 different authors, and yet it has one central theme, and that theme is to help us get our lives right with God. That's what the whole book's about. It's a marvelous book. And then there's some of you have come to a place where you've said, man, I just want to lay it all on the line. I, I, I remember uh, somebody telling me one day, he described it like this, he'd been a gambler in his life, and he said, preacher, I've come to the point where I just pushed it all out on the table, and I'm all in for Jesus. Some of you are all in for Jesus, and that's good to be in that position. But I want you to understand something now. 
I want you to misunderstand this. Uh, I don't want you to see this as a chronology of the Christian life. Be easy to do that when I've talked about these different stages of growth. But I don't want you to look at this as a chronology of the Christian life because you, you may have been a Christian for 10 years or so and you think, well, I must be God-centered now because I've been in the church for a long time. No, 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 no. You could have gone backwards. The, the issue is your continued development and your walk with the Lord along the way. So very important. Uh, so I, I want you to understand good ground. That's me. I, I moved too quick. Uh, Good ground talks about lordship, and I've been explaining to you these different symbols in the New Testament, and Jesus explains them, and Mark 4 does a wonderful job with that, and uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, something this morning, I think, that'll help you along the way, but here's what I want you to see. If you are a Christian at all, you're God-centered. You say, I thought that's where we began. It is. But I want to tell you something. When you get saved, you're God-centered. You have to give all that you know of yourself to all you know about God if you're a Christian at all. So that's where we begin. We all are God-centered. You have to come to a place where you acknowledge that he's Lord of your life and you're willing to give up your life to serve the Lord and walk with him. So we accept him as our Savior. And then here's what happens. The birds of the air come. Tribulation comes and temptation. We talked about that and the cares of the world. And persecution arises. And so the issue is how do you stay God-centered? That's the issue that we want to talk about this morning. And this parable in Mark 4 is also in Luke 8 and in Matthew 13. Now I want to show you the fourth category in Luke this morning for just a moment, just one verse that's there. Luke 8, verse 15. He says, but the ones that fell on good ground. Now, he's going to tell us what good ground is. I told you that if you look at a symbol in the Scripture, if you look at it in other places in the Scripture, the Bible will define it, define itself. And there he describes what good ground is. He tells us, he said, but the ones that the seed that fell on the good ground are those who are having heard the word and with a noble and good heart keep it and bear fruit with patience. Mark says they will bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100-fold. But here's the key. According to the Bible, Good ground, get it now, represents a good heart. So if your heart is good, you're good ground. You're a place where the seed can get down in there and begin to grow and develop. So I want to talk to you about two things this morning. What constitutes a good heart? Just two points. Good ground is a humble heart. And number two, good ground is a holy heart. If you're God-centered this morning, your, your life will be characterized by humility and by a lifestyle of holiness. And I want to say to you up front, if your life's not characterized by humility and by holiness, you don't know my Lord. That's the least you can get by with in the kingdom of God. The scripture says without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So this is a necessity that we understand what holiness is, that we become God-centered. Now, uh, so Mark tells us, we looked at the parable about Jesus tells the parable and the disciples said, explain it. And Luke tells us a little more about, he says, good ground is a good heart. So I want you to look at Matthew 13, because the parable's also here, and Matthew tells us what happens in between, and it's extremely important. Matthew 13, verse 10, says, The disciples came and said to him, said to Jesus, Why do you speak in parables? And he answered and said to them, Now this is very, very important, because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But to them, it's not been given. Now, he'll, I'll explain that in a minute. He says, for whoever has, get this, 
to him more will be given and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables. Now he's going to explain it, verse 14. And in them, these, these that are, are not understanding the parable, he says, and in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is, feel, is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For, I the word henos, purpose clause, because, because their hearts, again, it goes back to the heart. He says, whether there's good ground or stony ground or hard ground, it goes back to the heart. The hearts of this people have grown dull. Now, I want you to notice your heart can grow dull. He says, their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes, this is very important. He says, they have closed. Notice they closed their eyes, lest they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Now, to me, that's an amazing scripture. Here's what he's saying. He's saying to his disciples, they, they said, Lord, uh, why do you speak in parables to these people? He said, it's because you know the kingdom of God and the mysteries of God. has been given to you. But he said, they have a heart problem. And the reason they don't understand, they have a heart problem. And I speak to them in parables. Now, listen, I, hear me carefully. If you ever wonder sometimes, why does that guy get so much revelation? Or why does that person bear so much fruit? Because I read the same word that he does or she does. Listen to me. It's what's your heart that makes the difference. Because the seed, stay with me. I'm about to preach a little bit now. Because the seed is the same whether it falls on hard ground or soft ground. The ground is the difference maker. The seed will produce whatever ground it falls on if it can get in the ground. But if it's hard, if, it, if it's not been broken up by the Spirit of God, then there is no way for the seed to get down in the Word. Now, uh, I read to you a scripture a bit ago, and, and I, I, let, me, let me do it this way. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. Ezekiel 36, verse 26, God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will take the heart of stone, that would be a hard heart, out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That would be a soft heart. Now, when does that happen? It happens when you put your faith in Christ. That's the beginning of the Christian life. That's where we all start. God gives us a new heart, a heart that will receive the word of God. But here's what happens. The enemy comes along then with trials, with persecutions. That's number two in the scriptures that we read in this parable. And then the thorns start showing up. And the thorns start pushing the word of God out. A bitterness creeps into our life and we start hardening our heart. And the soil is get, gets to a place that it can't receive the truth. And so we no longer have good ground. The heart gets messed up in the process. So, now what constitutes a good heart? Okay, a good heart is a humble heart. Isaiah 57 verse 15. For thus says the high and the lofty one, that's talking about God, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Now notice this. God says, I dwell in the high and the holy place. But notice, I dwell with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of those that are humble. So God lives in a high place, but he also lives in the heart of someone whose heart's tender toward him and the things of God. If your heart's humble, then God will prepare your heart to receive truth from his word. Psalm 10, verse 17 says, I love this. Lord, you've heard the desire of the humble. 
you will prepare their heart. What will he prepare your heart for? He'll prepare your heart to receive the word of God. If you're humble and have a contrite heart, he'll fix your heart for you so it will receive the word of God. That's good news. That's good news. Ever since I was a kid, I'm going to just be honest this morning. Ever since I was a kid, I've struggled with the sin of pride. <laughs> Uh, but God has dealt with me ab about pride since I was young. I, I don't know why. I just thought I was all of that in a bag of chips. I, I don't know. But the Lord has continued to deal with me. And it's been kind of funny the way the Lord ha has dealt with me many times. When I was just a young kid, a teenager, I had a 1958 Chevrolet two-door hardtop. It was sharp. Man, I loved that car. It had a V8 283 short block with a four-barrel carburetor, 243 horsepower. It would burn rubber, man. I mean, uh, that was back now before Brenda and I got married, but we were dating. <laughs> and I loved showing out in my car, that 58 Chevy. And the thing in our town, we lived in a little town called Nortonville, Kentucky. And Nortonville was a big place, population 700. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, and the thing in our town, it had a four-way stop on one end of town, and Faye's drive-in was at the south end of town. Brenda worked as a car hop at Faye's drive-in. And the thing that we would do, those of us that had a car, we would drive up to Faye's drive-in, had a telephone pole at the end of the driveway. We'd circle the pole get on Highway 41 and drive to the other end of town, about three quarters of a mile, wasn't very far, to, to the other end of town to the four-way stop, turn around, drive back to the drive-in, circle the pole, drive back and back and forth. And man, I love to show my car off. I waxed that thing every two weeks. I, it shined like brand new money. Well, and I, I like to show out when I would leave the parking lot. I told you it would burn rubber. One night, we pull, I pulled up, up to the four-way stop, drove three quarters of a mile across town to phase drive-in, drove in the parking lot, circled the pole. I got around the pole, still sitting in gravel. And I decided I was gonna really show out. I put my foot on the brake, kicked that power glide into low range, <laughs> tromped on the gas, the back end raised up. I turned loose of my brake, and all at once that thing started spinning, and I took off, and boy, it was just kicking gravel everywhere. And my positive traction rear end caught that concrete, and it went clang! I broke a tooth off of the ring gear in my differential. <laughs> And oh, every time it would go over that broken spot, clang, clang, clang. God has a way of humbling your pride. <laughs> and God's not into pride, I guarantee you. He's not into pride. You hearing what I'm saying? God doesn't dwell in a heart that thinks they know everything. Because you see, if you think you know everything, God can't teach you anything. If you'll take the low road, it'll become the high road. If you'll take the low road. But if you think you're all of that in a bag of chips like I did, God's got to humble you first. And it's a whole lot easier if you'll humble yourself rather than him having to humble you. I like to never got my car fixed. <laughs> uh, oh, God is so good. God is so good. God loves you, and God wants you to be humble. He wants to help you to glorify him, and he'll do it. He'll humble you if, and help you. Out. He'll prepare your heart. Well, secondly, what is a, what's, a, what's a good heart look like? A good heart is a holy heart. And this is important. 
Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus says the, the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell. And the word dwell means to settle down and be at home. When everything is fixed, you can settle down. If we got company coming, my wife can't settle down. She's just going, stirring here and there, fixing this, fixing that. But when she gets everything ready, she can settle down and just dwell and enjoy the fellowship of people coming, going. God says, I want to do that for you. I want to fix your life where, where you can settle down and feel at home in the family of God. Feel at home in church. Greg was right. When you come to church, you can just lay your burdens down and you've had a tough week. It's, it's good to be able to know, man, there's a place where I can go and hang out with God's people and whew, just dwell. I don't have to pretend. I don't have to try to be something I'm not. I can just be what God wants me to be. I can dwell in the presence of God. Now notice he says that I dwell in the presence of a holy God. Now all of us, I think all of us know, no one would argue that God's holy, right? Uh, we know that God's perfect, but this is not talking about perfection. And we don't understand the word holy, what the word holy means. We think it means perfection. And when it relates to when it's talking about God, it is talking about perfection because God's perfect. We think it means sinless. That's not what the word holy means. It doesn't mean that we never do something that's wrong. The word, the word holy, now hear me. This is the sermon this morning. The word holy simply means I'm set apart to God, totally, exclusively to God. I've pushed everything on the table. I've given it all to God. I'm his, totally yielded to God. There's a scripture, if it means sinless, we're in trouble because the scripture, 1 Peter 15 says, but he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct because it's written, be holy, for I am holy. And if that means sinless perfection, that means that you also must be perfectly sinless in all of your conduct. But that's not what it means. Here's what it means. You also are to be set apart in your conduct from a sin-filled fallen world and Live with a clean heart, a pure heart, and you can live differently and walk differently because God's preparing your heart. It's not something, I can't do that anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. God fixed my heart. And he prepared me in such a way that he changed me within to be different along the way. Now, the word holy, the scripture in 1 Peter 15 and 16, comes from the book of Le Leviticus. It's given to us four times in the book of Leviticus where God says, be holy for I am holy. In chapter 11, it's mentioned once. In chapter 19, it's mentioned once. And it's twice in chapter 20. Now, let me show you one of those times in chapter 20. He says, you must be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. Now, he's going to explain something. I have set you apart from all the other people to be my very own. God says, I will take you. I will set you apart from what's wrong. I'll move you over here. In fact, the Bible says that we are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son when we get saved. And so God takes us away from the wrong and sets us apart into a kingdom that's right. That's what holiness is. It's God setting us apart to live totally and completely for him. Now, uh, back to Matthew. We're going to go back and forth a little bit here. Matthew 15, 1. And sometimes the script, there's certain scriptures that I just like to share them with you because to me they're funny. And this is one of those. The scribes and the Pharisees who are from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tra tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. 
Now, to me, that's hilarious because most of them were fishermen. And Pharisees said, your disciples don't wash their hands when they eat bread. He said, well, so what? They're fishermen. And fishermen don't wash their hands for much of anything. My stepdad was a fisherman. His name was John. And he and I would fish together sometimes. And we, we, we fished out of a little John boat, a little 14-foot John boat. And he liked to sit in the front end, and, and he would cast with his rod. And he'd be casting, and he'd catch a fish. He'd be eating lunch and have a sandwich laying beside him, biting lunch off. And he'd catch a fish, reel that fish in, get both hands on it. And he, we practiced catch and release. And so he would get both hands, take it off the hook, put it back in the water, reach his hands off, pick that sandwich up, and never wipe his hands off. Fishermen, and to me, that's just hilarious. They come to Jesus and say, hey, you know, i got a problem for your disciples. They don't wash their hands when they eat. Uh, Jesus said, no, <laughs> really, that doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean much to me. I don't ever see them wash their hands. And so now... I'm going somewhere. Back in 15, verse 7, Jesus says about these Pharisees, hypocrites, <laughs> well, did Isaiah, we read Isaiah a minute ago, prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips. Get this. But their heart goes back to the heart. Their heart is far from me. And so the disciples come, and they verse 12, they say, Jesus, do you know those Pharisees got offended when you heard, they heard you say what you did to them, taught them hypocrite? I love what he said back to the disciples. Here's where this comes from. You all have heard it. He says to them, if I can get it to move up, help me a little, okay? Verse 14, he said, ah, oh, just leave them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. They're going to just fall into a ditch. And so Peter, the ever-questioning one, says, Lord, you need to explain this parable about eating with unwashed hands to us as well. So he says, verse 15, or verse 16, he says, are you guys still without understanding? I, I, how many times do you read that? Jesus says that to the disciples. Don't you get it yet? Do you not understand that Whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and it gets eliminated. But those things which proceed out of the mouth that come from the heart, that's what will defile the man. And the Pharisees were struggling with germs on their hands. He said, I'm not talking about that. You may get some germs in your body, but you can live with that. But if you don't get your heart right, you can't go to heaven. And that's what he's talking about here. So, if you want your heart to be good ground and receive the word of God, you're going to have to keep your heart set apart. Now stay with me. You're going to have to keep your heart set apart from the world because what you allow to come into your heart will affect how you can hear and how you can understand the word of God. Now let me say it another word, another way. When we talk about the heart thinking, and I want you to notice that the heart can think. He says, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Your heart can think. You say, I don't think with my heart. I think with my mind. Let me help you. What you receive in your mind and you think about and you meditate on it and you rehearse it over and over and over will become thoughts of your heart. Now, here's the way the enemy does. You're trying to walk with God, and the enemy hits you with a temptation. And somebody says to you, well, you're just not living right. And you say, well, they ought not have said that to me. And the devil says, that's exactly right. And so you start rehearsing that over and over in your mind. You nurse that thought. They shouldn't have said that, and your bitterness starts to creep in. And hardness starts to happen. And your heart gets hard, and the seed just falls on the hard ground then and can't get into the ground. Jesus said it's a matter of the heart, for out of the heart proceed 
evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are all, and that's how they get in your heart and become thoughts of your heart. And he says that will defile you if they become thoughts of your heart. So don't let bitterness get a stronghold into your life. You say, how do you keep that from happening? When I was in Asbury College many years ago, my, one of my profs said, I'm going to help you men with the truth today. And here was the truth. This is worth your coming this morning. He said, your mind has the power of attention. God made you in such a way that you have the key to determine what your mind thinks about. Now, he said, you can't keep evil thoughts from coming and hitting you, but you've been given by God the power of attention to put your mind on something else. And remember, I told you last week, you get the bad stuff out by putting the good stuff in. And so you have this ability to put your mind on good thoughts and it will push out the bad thoughts. And that's the way you live an overcoming. That's how you live a holy life. You can't keep bad thoughts from coming. They're going to come. Temptations are going to come. But what do you do with them? You put them aside. You push them aside by putting in the Word of God, by singing some of the old hymns, by quoting Scripture. That's how you get rid of the bad stuff in your life. So good ground is good ground because you keep it good. And good ground is a humble heart, and good ground is a holy heart along the way. Okay? Well, he said, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. I've talked about that. And I gave you this verse about three weeks ago. This is how we live an overcoming life. You overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb. When a bad thought hits you, you say, I've put that under the blood. When a thought comes that's wrong, you say, this is by testimony. God has changed my life. I, he forgave me, so I'm going to forgive you. And you give your life away, and you're willing to give up the bad things, and you move on. That's how you walk with the Lord. And that's how you put that scripture into place. So that means you have to do this. You have to change your thinking and you set your mind on things above. Now I love this verse in Colossians. This, this is helpful for you as a Christian now. This is how you keep your heart good ground. He says, if then you've been raised, and the word if then is a purpose clause and it means since or because you have been raised with Christ Seek those things that are above, where Christ is. Now, where is he? He's seated at the right hand of God. Now, where's God? We saw in Isaiah that he's high and lifted up. But I get to live there with him because of grace, and I've been lifted up and seated in heavenly places with him. And so if he overcomes, I'm a co-heir with Jesus, and I'm an overcomer. Hallelujah. That's how we live a victorious life. Now, the key is you set the agenda for your life. You've been given the ability to think. The devil can't, can't make you continue to think about something that's wrong. And if you will not do that, if you won't nurse it, rehearse it, if you'll reverse it by setting your affection on things above, you'll find your life giving fruit 30, 60, 100-fold to the Lord. But you set the agenda. You set the agenda. That means you've got to be careful about what you put on the screen on your computer. Preach a while now. You can't hobnob in the devil's territory and keep a holy heart. You can't keep a pop-up from coming that's wrong on your TV screen or on your computer screen. You can't keep that from happening sometimes. Even the best of filters, and I recommend that you have a filter on your computer, but you can't keep a pop-up from coming. But what do you do with that pop-up when you see it? You either turn it off or you say, boy, I'm just going to look at that a little while longer. 
If you'll turn it off and put a scripture in its place, you'll drive out the thought of evil and there will be affections that you set and move them toward heaven. That's how you live and walk in victory. That's what holiness is. Please hear me. Holiness is not coming to the altar once, coming to the altar twice and bumping your head there and saying, I got saved, I got sanctified, and get up and go and never live a holy life after that. No, sir. I do believe in coming and getting justified. I do believe that you need to give yourself totally, and yield yourself as a living sacrifice to God. But if you don't live right when you walk away, it's not going to help you very much. And you've got to set your affection. You have control of that. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. You set your affections on Jesus. He's at the right hand of God. And set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Okay? Now, Isaiah 57, 10 and 11. Here, here's another analogy. And I, I'm... I'm tr- we're just moving through stuff quickly. And I, but I, you got to see this. In the parable, there are three words. He talks about ground. He talks about seed. And he talks about fruit. Isaiah 57 talks about the same thing. He says, the rain and the snow come down from the heavens. And they stay on the ground to water the earth, the heart. They cause the grain, get it, to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. Jesus says, it's the same with my word. I send it out and it always, get that word always, it always produces fruit. But it can only produce if it can get into the ground. And Jesus says in John 12, Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, becomes humble, it will abide alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. Okay? And he says, now, it will accomplish all I want it to. Get this, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Now, let me help you a little bit more. Isaiah says, you'll live, if you'll live like this, you'll live in joy and peace. The mountains and the hills will burst forth into song. And the trees of the field, that's you. A tree in the scripture represents a man who lives, uh, Psalm 1, he's a man who, who walks in the ways of the Lord and he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water of life, has roots that go down deep, deep, deep into the water. He says, you will burst forth into song and the trees of the field will clap their hands where once there was uh, thorns. Heard that word before? Where once there was thorns, he says cypress trees will start to grow. Now, if you know anything about Florida or Georgia, you've been in Savannah, what kind of trees do you see there? Big old cypress trees. And God says, if you'll put your word in in your put my word in your heart. I will begin to water that seed in you and the thorns, I'll get them out of the way and you will become a cypress tree for me. You'll grow up and be strong and steady in your walk with me. I want to be a cypress. How about you? Here's the key and I'm done. Proverbs 4 verses 20 through 23 And this is the Christian uh, Standard Bible translation. Solomon's writing to his son, Rehoboam. And he says, my son, pay attention to my words. Now, they're God's words. God's inspired them. Listen closely, he says, to my sayings. Don't lose sight of them. Keep them within your heart. How do you keep them in your heart? Go back a couple of messages. We Hide his word in our heart that we might not sin against God. We memorize it and we meditate on the word of God. So he says, 
If you'll keep your words, keep them within your heart, they will be life to you if you find them and health to your whole body. Now get it. Here's the, here's the warning to his son. He says, son, guard your heart above all else for it is the source of life. Keep your heart humble, keep your heart holy, and God will cause you to become a cypress tree for him. Amen? Well, I'm going to end the message like I've ended every message in this series. We do this every Sunday here. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? And it may be that he's been speaking to you throughout this series and there's something you need to deal with. Maybe you've not yet crossed that line of faith where you put your faith and your trust in the Lord. And maybe you've said, I do believe, but you've never confessed him publicly. Maybe you need to do that this morning. And it may be this week, that sometime during the week, you'll be thinking about the message again. Maybe you'll look at it online again and, and the Holy Spirit will say something to you then. But what's he saying to you? That's what I want to know. What's he saying to you? And what he says to you is life and growth and happiness and fulfillment. Your journey will be good if you pay attention to the voice within. Lord, would you help us now? In these moments, just in the quietness, Lord, settle among us for a moment. With our heads bowed and nobody looking around, I want you to just pray and ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me with this message? What do I need to do? Maybe some pride has slipped in where humility ought to have been. Maybe your computer needs to be adjusted at home. And the thoughts in your mind, you haven't been driving them out. And you've kind of nurtured them and rehearsed them. Maybe the Lord wants to fix that for you this morning. Maybe you've never declared him as your Savior. And you need to do that. I don't know. Whatever's the Holy Spirit saying to you, you do that. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and then we're going to go. Number one, have you come to a place on this journey where you know your heart is right with God? That's the issue. Is your heart right with God? And if it's not, would you just slip your hand up and take it back down? And I'll pray for you. We, we believe in prayer here. It makes a difference. My heart's not right, preacher. Pray for me. Anyone quickly? Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Anyone else? Quickly, just up and back down. My heart's not right with God. Any of you here this morning, you have been praying, but you've not confessed Christ publicly. and You need to do that. And you'd like for prayer for that to happen in your life. Would you just slip your hand up and take it back down? I need to confess him as my personal Lord. Anyone quickly? Anyone this morning who would say, my heart has not been holy and I need to follow the Lord in this area of my life. I need to make some changes. Would you slip your hand up and take it right back down? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask you to do this. this, this it's a little bit difficult, but I'm going to ask you to do this. If you need prayer, I want you to just stand to your feet right now, quickly. Wherever you are, just stand to your feet. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Just stand to your feet. If you need prayer for any area we've talked about, just stand to your feet. Lord, you see every individual who's standing. And I thank you that they're people of integrity and they want to do business with you. Now, Lord, you know what you spoke to them about. 
I can't fix anything in their heart, but you can fix all of their needs. And so, Lord, whether it was an issue of holiness, an issue of thought life, an issue of bitterness, or just giving all to you, I want all of you that are standing right now to just pray in your heart, Lord Jesus, I yield everything that I am into everything I know about you. Just just pray that prayer. Lord, I give all I know of myself to all I know about you. Here's an area. Fix it in Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that prayer while you're standing, just hold your hands up, both of them. Just hold them up high to the Lord. Lord, thank you now. You thank him. Thank you, Lord. You've done a work in me this day, and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody stand to your feet. May the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Get ready for Easter. Easter's coming. There's some cards out in the foyer there. Pick up some of those as you go to give out. It'll help people to know who we are, what time we have church here And we're wanting to have all of you back next Sunday and Easter Sunday. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. It'll be a special day next week. God bless you. You're dismissed.